Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome indeed to the University of Sussex and our Institute of Physics and the Evening Lecture. Um, tonight, we have Dr. Apijita Werner from the University of Oxford. Apijita is the um, Deputy Project Scientist with an extremely, the European Extremely Large Telescope. And um, tonight's talk is all, all about that. Her research area is looking at some high redshift galaxies. And, um, well, without any further ado, we're delighted to have you here this evening. Thank you for coming from Oxford. And, um, yes, take it away, Dr. Jesus. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Darren, and for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'm really excited to tell you about this kind of phenomenal project that we're having um, come up. Oh, I'm sorry, have I put this on? Is that better? Yes. Okay. Um, so this is, um, as Darren explained, the European Extremely Large Telescope. And this is actually a telescope that's being built by an organisation called ESO, uh, which is the European Southern Observatory. Um, and they already have um, some of the world's leading telescopes that I'll talk about a bit later. And this is kind of their flagship project for the forthcoming decade. Um, and as Darren mentioned, I'm part of the UK ELT team. Um, I'll talk about that a bit later. And just thanks to some of my colleagues at ESO and within the UK project as well. And I'm going to show you quite a lot of these very nice looking pictures. Um, these are made by ESO. And so forgive me if you get a bit bored seeing them, but I really like them. So you'll see these scattered about um, throughout the talk. And this is basically a summary of what this telescope is. So it will be the world's largest eye on the sky, uh, operating in the optical to near-infrared bands, uh, sorry, mid-infrared bands. And it's actually a 39-meter telescope. Um, it was approved in December 2012. And just last week, the first actual funding has approved, which means the project can kick off in earnest. Um, and it's expected to be operational in 2024. Um, with a total cost of about a billion euros. So it's not cheap, but you need that kind of investment to have large projects like this. And indeed, you need organisations like ESO, which has uh, several member state countries, um, to be able to, for the astronomy community, to be able to have a facility like this. This is not something that a country can do on their own. And as I mentioned, it's a, it really is a top priority for European great ground-based astronomy. So why do we need an ELT? And primarily, um, the science is the driver. So there are three foundations to ELT science. Um, the first being contemporary science, which basically means building on the science that we know now and predicting what, the, or what impact or what data we can get with the ELT. And this is basically split over several standard fields that I, I will discuss at the end of the talk. So, the standard fields are planets and stars, so understanding extrasolar planets, star formation, uh, how uh, extrasolar planets formed from their initial disks around stars, um, stars and galaxies, so that includes looking at the way stars move in galaxies, the kinds of stars in galaxies, and how galaxies like our Milky Way first started their life. And then right through to the very high redshift, so looking at the very first light in the universe, so when stars and galaxies first formed, trying to look at their properties, um, also looking at the cosmology of the universe, why the universe looks like it is, and also measuring parameters in the universe, like is it expanding. Um, the second foundation is the synergy with other facilities, and to explain this in less boring words, basically the universe is, is full of light at all wavelengths. And as you can see here, right in the center, the visible band is actually very narrow. So we have light, you know, right from the radio, right through to the gamma rays. So the light this telescope is sensitive to is, is around that region there. Um, but basically, astronomical objects have very different <coughs> properties in different light. So this is actually an image, a compilation of Centaurus A. And here you can see what Centaurus A looks like in different light, in different types of light. So going from the X-ray, UV, optical, to the mid-infrared, the radio, and the H1, which is neutral gas. 
Um, but if you imagine, basically all of ground-based astronomy has, up until recently, really been focused on the optical. So if you'd looked at Centaurus A 50 years ago, that's all we would know. We'd see this kind of halo of stars with a dark band across. But you can see that spectacularly, in the different bands, you see very different morphologies. Here you see a huge X-ray cloud as well as a jet. Um, in the radio, you see also this very extended jet. And then when you look in the infrared bands, which basically allows you to look through dust, because the dust basically obscures the optical light, but then re-emits it at longer wavelengths in the mid-infrared, you can actually see right into the inner core of the galaxy. And you can see basically a compact source in the center there, and it's that source which has a black hole in it that's producing this radio jet that you see here, as well as all this X-ray emission. So you can kind of see that you need to really understand what objects are like in the universe. You need a multi-wavelength view. And the ELT fits in the sense that it's going to give us some of the deepest and best data we'll have in this regime. And it will be complementary to other facilities that are coming online. <clears throat> then the final thing is discovery potential. And what that means is that usually when you really push the boundaries of technology and the kinds of scales of telescopes that we use, you can guarantee we will basically find things that we've never predicted. So the third and probably the most interesting part of the science case is the stuff we can't put down on paper. This is all the unknown things, all the new discoveries, but for sure these are going to be discoveries that happen and there'll be a wealth of data and information we'll get from the ELT. <coughs> Excuse me. So why do we want big telescopes? Well, there's lots of big science. There's still lots of big questions. Astronomy is still in a state of exploration. Um, its advance can be limited by te current technology, but it also drives technology. For example, radio telescopes are the reason why you have um, you know, mobile phones and Wi-Fi access. Basically, the, one of the chips that are used was developed for radio astronomy. So there's a lot of synergies between what <coughs> astronomers do, well, a lot of spin-offs from what we do, and the technology drives that uh, result. Um, so, as I mentioned, the new large telescopes will lead to new and fundamental discoveries, um, but it's also such a huge project that it's not just for science, it's also a technological challenge, it's a computing challenge, and an engineering challenge, all at the same time. And hopefully things of this scale and this impact will inspire the next generation of scientists and engineers. So I'm going to go a little backwards now, back to the beginning of, of where telescopic astronomy started, just to give you a bit of background as to how we got to the ELT um, that we, have, we will have in the next decade. So it all started in, in 1609 with Galileo Galilei, who basically took Lippe-Hay's magnifying spyglass and turned it to the skies. He also improved the lenses that were used and achieved a magnification of 20 times. And it was absolutely revolutionary. Here you can see some of the staggering um, images he took, or sorry, not image, uh, drawings he made from the things he saw through his telescope. So he found sunspots. Uh, he was able to draw the moon's craters and the prominences, uh, the moons of Jupiter, the phases of Venus, as well as identifying the ears of Saturn or the the rings as we know them today. You can see in 1609, astronomy took a huge leap. And then it was almost immediately that we started having the world's first giant telescopes. So there are several names here, and these are all kind of pioneers of, of modern astronomy. And basically what you see here is a little movie that's just showing how those telescopes worked. It's basically refraction which means you have a lens at one end here, the light comes in, it focuses at this point, and then you have an eyepiece down here with another lens, and that's what your eye um, would be receiving. Um, and basically, the way that these are made was just by making bigger and bigger, bigger versions of refractors. So down here, you see um, Johannes Hevelius's um, very long telescope here. It's 45 metres long. So we're already getting to the 40 metre stage. But obviously these are really difficult to control. 
very cumbersome. Um, and by um, later in the century, the longest one was a 61 meter refractor. But as I mentioned, it's just very hard to control refractors. So then along came Isaac Newton, and actually in 1663, James Gregory discussed um, a reflecting telescope, so using mirrors rather than lenses. And here the light comes in, bounces off the primary mirror down here, up to another mirror there that then sends it out to, to the eyepiece that you see at number four. And basically, um, when you have lenses, you get a lot of chromatic aberration because light refracts um, with mirrors, you avoid that problem. So it is, a, again, a very revolutionary design. And this is really where modern astronomy took off. Um, so the first reflecting telescope was in 1668. And Newton's was presented to the Royal Society in 1672. And there you see a model of it there. And then the UK, or British astronomers, actually really led the field in ground-based astronomy. Um, so there's three Williams mentioned here who were all, again, pioneers of their time. I mean, William Herschel, right at the top there that you see there, got 400 telescopes during his life. And he's actually a musician. I mean, learning about these people is actually really interesting because they were not just astronomers. They were all really talented in some other way, businessmen, musicians, engineers, um, and it, they're interesting, you know, very dynamic people to, to learn about. And he also made the first casting of a large mirror, which was 1.26 metres across. William Lassell, who's down here, um, also then built another reflecting telescope, and he went even up to 24 and 48 inch telescopes in Malta, and he was also the one that really pioneered looking at the sites of the telescopes to increase the sensitivity that you got. So going away from towns, going to uh, very dry sites, which is why he was in, in Malta. Um, and then William Parsons built the Leviathan of Parson Town, which was a 1.83 metre telescope, and it actually remained the world's largest telescope well into the early 20th century. Oh, and, and these are just examples of the kinds of, um, or the resolution, the kinds of images that people were seeing through these incredible telescopes. And then on the other side of um, the Atlantic, George Ellery Hale in the US was really quite an astonishing man. He basically built four telescopes, each of which was the large telescope of its kind at the times he built them. So he really pushed the boundaries of getting bigger and bigger telescopes, culminating in the Palomar Observatory Hale Telescope with a 200-inch or about 5-metre-sized primary mirror. And this actually was built in, well, its construction was interrupted by the war, but it basically was completed in, in 1948. And sadly, um, he never saw it in operation. He died um, before then. But his legacy lived on because this was actually the world's largest telescope until 1976. So he was really ahead of his time. <clears throat> so this is actually the Hale telescope that you see here. And it's a five mirror. And there you see a, a, an image of the mirror itself. Um, and you can see this kind of very rigid and um, sturdy structure. And it's actually based on battleship engineering. So this is an, actually an incredible telescope to visit because it's very different to the telescopes we have now. I'll show some of those later. But it's just incredibly precise, even though it's incredibly heavy, and it's just an engineering wonder, I think. So after you built the hail, then there was a development in how to make things bigger. And the big change was actually producing thin rather than these very heavy mirrors. And the reason why that's important is because you want the telescope to be light and manoeuvrable. And this is this thin, thin film, aluminized thin mirrors, is what's really pushed um, to the big telescopes that we have today. And they're also made of toughened material that's insensitive to temperature, so you can really maintain um, the surface and, and the image quality that you get. And this is basically what's used in all the large telescopes that we use 
at the moment. So these are all telescopes that are greater than 8 metres across. So you have the very large telescopes that are also run by ESO. The Keck, which is currently one of the largest telescopes with a mirror of 10 metres across, um, which is in Hawaii. Uh, the very large telescopes were in Chile. And then Gemini North and South, which are 8 metre telescopes in Chile and Hawaii as well. So just to put that into context, this is just a chart showing um, date, obviously, along the bottom, and then altitude here. But what you see with these blue circles here are basically representing the size of the mirror. So you can see the two, one, two of the telescopes I mentioned earlier, the Hooker and the Hale telescope, um, and that's the Hale at 1948. And then you see basically all the kind of professionally used telescopes with mirror diameters greater than two meters um, up to the present day. So those are the Kecks that I showed you in Hawaii. And then we have a host of kind of uh, telescopes around eight to 10 meters across. And then just to show you what the ELT is in comparison. So what you see here is, again, this dramatic increase. And the things to note is that basically every 10, 20 years, you get these scale change jumps. And this is really the next one to be made. And it's also the area of this telescope will actually be slightly larger than if you put all the two meter telescopes and higher together. So it's really a staggering scale change from what we know now. So why is having a big mirror important? Well, firstly, the bigger the mirror you have, the more light you collect. So it allows you to peer deeper into the universe. But also the spatial resolution you get, so the, the detail that you can resolve, actually increases. So you see finer detail the larger your mirror is. So that's, those are the real drivers that you get a deeper and finer view of the universe. <coughs> and some of you may know we do have already very large radio telescopes. Um, so the reason why we have this is actually spatial resolution also becomes um, bigger the longer wavelength you look at. So compared to the optical, the radio is at a longer wavelength, so you actually need um, bigger mirrors to get to similar scales in the optical as in the radio. But also, you need your surfaces to be very well aligned. Now, because that's 10% of the wavelength, it's actually easier to make very well aligned surfaces at longer wavelengths, like the radio, than it is in the optical. So it's actually been very difficult to do this, um, but we're now at the stage where we're technologically ready and able to make the surface alignment that you need to do this in the optical to get that very fine resolution. So as I mentioned, there's the alignment, but there's also the precision of the surface. So this is actually a picture of the very large telescope mirror. It has a diameter of 8.2 meters across. And the precision of the mirror surface is incredibly fine. So what that number actually means is if you took ripples on water of a few centimetres, but actually spread that out over the entire Atlantic Ocean. <coughs> That's the kind of precision you need in the mirror surface. So it's a really challenging and difficult thing to do. But how do you make such large mirrors? Well, currently the largest mirror that can be manufactured to that precision is eight metres across, which is why we have eight metre telescopes as being our current limit. So how do you build something that's 40 metres across? And you may have seen this in, in the earlier slides, but the trick is to use tessellated surfaces. So already in, in 1935, um, Guido Horn de Arturo already started building up a segmented mirror using hexagons, which uh, tessellate very well and give you a, a very uniform coverage across the surface. And this is actually what's used in the Keck 10 meter telescope. So moving on to the ELT, this is exactly what is being used to build up the ELT primary mirror. And again, forgive me for showing yet another picture, but you can see kind of the scale of this thing. This is a truck, not a car. So, you know, that gives you a feeling for how large this is. So this is um, just a slide, a, little, a couple of slides about the ELT primary mirror itself. So it's actually made of 798 segments, hexagonal segments. They're about 1.2 meters across. I'm oh, sorry, 1.4 metres across. And basically, 
to preserve the quality of the surface of the mirror, every day, one, two, three segments will be removed for cleaning and recoating. So that basically means that the entire surface of the mirror is refreshed over 18 months. And it's made of a, a low thermal expansion glass, so you can pre preserve the surface of the mirror. And the reason I have a picture of a ceramic hob there is because it's exactly that kind of material. It's very low expansion and it retains the surface. And this just shows you the segments in a bit more detail. And what you can see here is that there's a very intricate support structure underneath that basically maintains the parabolic shape of the mirror. And here under each segment, you can kind of see these green tubes here, or you see them here. These are actually three motors or actuators that actually distort the surface of the mirror. So you can imagine that you, know, you really need to maintain this parabolic shape. And this telescope, as you can see kind of in this, is a classical telescope. It needs to, uh, it's an Altaz mount, which means that as you look at particular objects, you need to track the object around the sky, but it also needs to track the motion in this direction. So that whole surface has to move. Um, and because it's so large, it's also very sensitive to gravity and problems like wind and vibrations that, that can distort the surface of the mirror. So each of those three motors that I showed you in the previous slide basically distort the shape of the mirror so that it maintains this beautiful parabolic shape no matter where it's pointing to, and it compensates for things like wind and vibration. So the whole thing is enormous, um, as I keep mentioning, but it's about 2,500 tons of steel, and that moves about 700 tons of optomechanics. So it's a really mammoth, huge thing. And this is just to tell you a bit more about the telescope design itself. So basically, this is what it looks like. And if you remember the pictures of the Hale telescope with the big steel and sturdy structure, this is incredibly different. You see a very kind of spindly, thin structure and the mirror, again, is designed to be very thin, so it's as light as it possibly can be. And basically, this is your primary mirror here. I'll show you the light path in another e uh, picture. Basically, it comes down, gets reflected up to this second mirror up here. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, gets passed down to a flat mirror down here, up to a mirror here called the fourth mirror, M4. Um, and then finally to a fifth mirror that then directs the light to these two platforms here. And that's where the actual instruments, so the, the things that record the light and then um, that we then analyse, that's where they get recorded. <coughs> Excuse me. And these platforms themselves, again, just to give you a size reference, are the size of tennis courts. So again, this is just a very huge piece of kit. So this just shows the, the ray path in a bit more, well, hopefully a bit more clearly. So the light comes in, goes up, down, up again to the fifth mirror and then out to the side. And one of the um, things just to note here is this is basically the William Herschel telescope, which is a, a four meter telescope in La Palma. And basically the size of the mirror up here is like hanging this telescope on top of this primary. So again, to give you a scale, uh, scale reference, this is you know, a very challenging thing to do with a very heavy secondary mirror that has to be suspended and supported above here. So just to talk a little bit about the dome itself, I heard earlier that um, the car park here is used for football um, events. And this dome that you see here is about the size of a football stadium. Um, and actually, this, uh, the current design is the dome has a base of about 84 metres, and it's about 74 metres high. You get 4,000 tonnes of steel, and this dome has to track. So as the telescope is observing, these huge doors open, and as the telescope moves, obviously the, the hole in the dome has to move with it. So that's, again, a very engineering-driven uh, challenge, and it's equipped with all the things you need to for heavy-duty um, lifting and machinery. And it's also seismically isolated. So moving on to that, so where is this telescope going to be? And obviously, you want to choose the bits where the population isn't. 
and it's actually several <coughs> sites were chosen for site testing, spread across um, Chile, Morocco, La Palma, and Argentina. Um, and the site that was chosen is actually in Chile. So I mentioned the very large telescopes, and there you can see down here on a peak called Paranal. That's what you see down there, and here you see the Vista telescope. And there's Amazonas, and that's actually where the ELT will sit. And it's about 20 kilometers away from the Paranal site. And way up here in the distance, you see Chile's active volcano. Um, but it's quite far away, it's about 200 kilometers away. But it's also um, a seismically active region. So all the support, the dome, the telescope itself have all been um, subject to seismic um, constraints in their design. And the very interesting thing is if you look here, this is actually a map of Chile or the region around Paranal and Amazonas. And that blue stripe there is, is the sea or the ocean. So what I find really incredible is it's only about seven kilometers inland from the sea. So you can imagine that you've got, and, and yet it's like 2,000, nearly 3,000 meters high. So you basically have you know, a very sharp incline, and this site is just incredible. If you can see here, there's very little vegetation. There's very few um, bad nights of weather, very little cloud. It basically gets stuck at this ridge, um, and you can see it more here. And so it's just an exceptional site. It's also very stunning to be there. And basically, in October, um, ESO and Chile reached an agreement that um, they would receive... 189 square kilometers of land around Amazonas to build the ELT, as well as receiving this protected purple area that you see there. So this whole section of land between Paranal, which is here, to Amazonas has been given to ESO uh, in exchange for 10% of the observing time. So I, uh, I just wanted to have one slide to kind of explain a little bit more about the actual sites where these telescopes are sited, because it's such an unusual place. So this is Paranal, so looking out um, from the Residencia um, out to the four VLTs that you see up there. And again, you can see it's very barren and dry. Um, and this is actually the best bit about Paranal. This is the Residencia, which is gorgeous. Um, and you might have seen it or, or remember it if any of you like James Bond. It was actually blown up. Not We didn't do that. that was, James Bond, uh, in the Quantum of Solace. And um, they actually didn't show the best bit, which is that they have a swimming pool inside that actually, because it's so dry up there, you can't actually, um, well, you could live there without um, having this atmospheric correction. But within the Residencia, um, it's very important to maintain the humidity. Um, it's extremely dry, so they have basically a biodome uh, where this pool, and people don't really use it for swimming, it's more to just to keep the air very moist. So this is just a, a shot of the Amazonas peak. Um, and some of you may remember in June, there was quite a lot of press activity about um, the mountain top being blasted off. So this is just a, a movie of that explosion. And I have to say it was probably the most... Um, least spectacular movie I've ever seen. Um, this actually wasn't what was shown um, on the live stream. I don't know if any of you saw it, but it was actually taken from Paranel. So you actually, all you saw was a little puff of, of cloud. But at, you know, this was just the first blast for removing basically the top of the mountain here to create a platform that's about 200 meters wide. And there you can see this was the first blast and they're already uh, progressing very well in removing much of the material to make the flat platform for the telescope to sit on. So this is just a, a little movie just to show. I'm not quite sure why the road disappears here, but it's not going away. But there you see, you know, within five years of construction, that's the kind of view we'll be able to see at Amazonas. So I should mention that we're not the only extremely large telescope project. There is also two others, the 30 meter telescope and the giant Magellan telescope. And you may have noticed by now that astronomers are not very inventive at naming their telescopes. 
Um, so um, unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Um, but the 30 meter is what it says. It's a 30 meter telescope basically being built by uh, a consortium of Californian universities with international partners. And the Giant Magellan Telescope differs slightly in that it's actually not using the hexagons to, to fill its um, primary mirror. It's actually made of seven eight meter telescope mirrors. Sorry, eight mirrors. Um, sorry, seven mirrors that are eight meters across. And that means that they have this kind of flower petal design. So they don't fill their aperture with, with mirror. And that's a collaboration of US universities, Australia and Korea. And basically, all these telescopes claim they're the first. Um, they've all had various stages of being announced and approved. Um, but basically, there's still gaps in funding for these telescopes. Um, so it's still a race on to see who gets actually first light first. So just to put this in context, I'm sure you've heard of the Hubble Space Telescope and the, um, its successor, the James Webb Space Telescope, which will be 6.5 meters across. This again just shows the scale of the ELT in comparison to these other forthcoming telescopes. So here's actually an image that was made by the UK project team um, to give it some UK scale reference. And this was actually made for the Royal Society Science Exhibition in, in 2010 that was at the South Bank. So we had a, you know, next time you're in London and you see the eye, maybe you can have a think about how big the ELT is going to be. So <clears throat> we said that we wanted a deep, finer view of the universe, but the real issue is the atmosphere. So atmospheric turbulence that you can kind of see here, this is looking at a crater of the moon, causes a lot of loss of detail and image quality. Um, and this is what this region would look like if you weren't looking through the atmosphere. So it's like looking at the universe through a swimming pool. So what if you were looking at stars? So this is basically what a star looks like through the atmosphere. You see this very distorted, and it's the same reason why stars twinkle. So it's actually the atmosphere is distorting the light before it gets to your eye. And so we don't, you know, to get this very fine view of the universe, we need to overcome the atmosphere. I mean, that's the reason why there are space telescopes like Hubble and James Webb. Um, and you would have seen images from them that are just astonishing detail. So what we want to do is go from something like this, or like you see in this movie, right through to the very compact images of a star that you would see, basically, that's just limited by the optics or the mirror surfaces of the telescope. So the atmosphere, it, it affects the spatial resolution we can obtain, but it also means that we don't get as much sensitivity as if we could focus all the light into a very compact uh, region. So this is um, just, you can kind of ignore this movie right now, but this just shows you kind of the increase in information we're going to get in the ELT. This is a region of, any region of the universe you'd see um, through the atmosphere. Then if you were in space with the Hubble Space Telescope above the atmosphere, you'd see this kind of quality. If we use the VLT with um, correction for the atmosphere, you can see this kind of quality and resolution. And then finally with the ELT, you can really start to see these fine things start to pop out, a lot more background objects, a lot more detail on the foreground objects. You can just resolve so much more. And so what you're seeing in the movie over here is actually um, a little demonstration of the technique we use called adaptive optics. So basically the light of the telescope comes in and the atmosphere is making these what we call wave fronts. And if there was no atmosphere, they would be perfectly parallel. But you can see they have some distortions in them. So what we do is then send that information to a computer. The computer knows what the star should look like if we didn't have an atmosphere. And it can basically um, reverse, put the reverse onto the surface of a mirror and basically correct the distortions in the wavefront back to something being parallel. So it might take a while to get to that point again, but there was a, a mirror within this sequence where you saw the surface basically rippling. And that ripple is the inverse of what the atmosphere is doing. 
So basically, there's a very big gain in sensitivity by building an extremely large telescope with very good adaptive optics. I'll just let it run through so that you can see that again. So basically, the light's coming into this, this unit, um, and it's recording the distorted light. Once you know how the light is being distorted, that gets fed back onto this mirrored surface here. So that's that little bit <laughs> of uh, animation, but you can see the surface there is basically compensating for the effects of the atmosphere to make the wave fronts flat. And that's what gives you the concentration of light. So the ELT will basically um, deliver five times better spatial resolution, so five times better detail, and 500 times faster exposure time, meaning it's a lot shorter to look at the same objects as eight meter telescopes. So this is, again, as I mentioned, this huge scale change in sensitivity and resolution will lead to incredible new discoveries. So um, just to show you the effects of this adaptive optics, these are actually images from um, a trial that ESO made on their eight meter telescopes. And this is a region in Omega Centauri where they tried to look at the, basically the stars that are present in this region with and without adaptive optics. So this is what you see without adaptive optics. Uh, this is with a very standard type of adaptive optics where you just monitor one star. And this is a more complex um, type of adaptive optics where you actually measure or you correct for different layers of turbulence in the atmosphere. And you can clearly see the difference here, especially if you look in the background. Um, you're really picking out a lot of the faint sources that you just would have missed without the adaptive optics correction. So um, if you remember any Hubble Space Telescope images, this is of the Hubble Deep Field. And what you can see there is a beautiful array of objects. Um, and some of them are very faint, some are very nicely resolved, but there's very few stars. And to do adaptive optics, you need stars. So how do we overcome this? <coughs> Excuse me. And the way we do that is to make our own stars, and that's using lasers. So these ba lasers basically fire up to the sodium layer, it's about 85 kilometers high, and they basically create an artificial star, um, and that's basically what you monitor to do the adaptive optics correction. So this is currently being used um, in several of the world's largest observatories, including the VLTs and Keck. Excuse me. And on the ELT, I didn't point these out earlier, but these yellow tubes here are basically the lasers that will be used with the ELT. And the mirror, you know, like in the movie I showed with the, um, the correction being applied onto that, is actually mirror four. And it basically has 6,000 6, motors behind it to distort the surface to make this very fast change to compensate for the atmospheric uh, turbulence. So the UK is actually involved in doing a lot of tests for the laser guide star systems for the ELT, and they're doing this through a demonstrator on the William Herschel telescope, the four meter I mentioned earlier in La Palma, um, and they're basically doing really incredible stuff and showing for the first time that different types of a uh, adaptive optics are working. And these are the first demonstrations of some novel techniques of doing AO, I won't go into the details, but this just shows a comparison on um, a nearby binary galaxy which has two merging components. This is what HST can do on the southern component compared to what um, this adaptive optics correction can do in, in about 20 minutes of observing. So you can see that it's a very successful um, and very useful technique and it's already producing images in very short time that are superior to Hubble. And that's on a four meter telescope. So it's, you know, just imagination to see how much better doing this on a 40 meter telescope is going to be. So here's another of these things. Anyway, I'll skip over them. Um, so as I mentioned, the telescope has instruments. And what I mean by instruments, it's what I see as kind of the eyes of the telescope, the things that record the light. So either as an image or a spectrograph which splits up the light into its individual wavelengths. Um, 
and currently two have been selected for first light, so um, they will be there from the outset of the ELT being built. And one of those, Harmony, is a spectrograph, is actually an imaging spectrograph. That means you basically take an image as you would um, with your digital camera, but if you imagine for every pixel in your image, you also get a spectrum. So you're able to basically look at the constituent light um, in, across a whole field and understand things like um, how the stars are moving, how the gas is moving, um, what kind of metals are being created. So you learn a lot from a combination of imaging spectroscopy. And the full instrument suite, which will consist of eight instruments, will be built up over the first decade. And the UK are very heavily involved in this. We have a very comprehensive programme that spans over instrumentation, also links with industry for actually building the ELT, including public engagement and also particularly from the science. <coughs> so here's another UK reference. Um, next time you see Big Ben, think of the ELT. And I'm just going to go through some of the science now. Um, so as I mentioned, there's the standard science cases um, that are really the drivers for the design of the ELT. And I'll just highlight a few of these for the last part of the talk. And it'll be rather quick since I'm, I'm running a bit late. Um, but one of the main drivers for the ELT is actually understanding um, extrasolar planets. So these are planets orbiting stars in the Milky Way, other than our own solar system. And if you imagine, in the last decade, well, 20 years ago was when we first heard about exoplanets, and the last decade has revealed, you know, thousands of planetary systems. And so this is really a new and exciting field. And because... Um, you need, because these planets themselves don't emit light, they just emit the radiated light from their star. Um, they're very difficult to detect. So you have this very bright star, um, you have a very faint planet next to it, and you basically need very high sensitivity, you need very high spatial resolution to disentangle their light. So this is just obviously a, a sketch of the solar system, but you can see it's very difficult to reach things like Earth very close to this very big star. What you actually are constrained by are the contrast ratios between the bright star and the very faint planet. And basically the ELT will have the capability to look at exoplanets from very different perspectives. Um, but we basically want to answer questions of how do planetary systems form? How common are they? Are they like our own solar system? Um, what atmospheres do they have? Are there other Earths? And can we detect signs of life, ultimately? So one of the things that ELT will be able to do is what we call direct detection. So that is actually recording the light from the planet itself. A lot of the exoplanets that we know about currently have been measured through indirect means. That means you look at the light of the star and you can infer there's a planet there by changes in the light of the star. But the ELT will have the spatial resolution and sensitivity to detect the planets themselves and also look at the disk, the material the planet's being born from. Um, so I mentioned this indirect method of, of, um, observing, of identifying planetary systems, but what the ELT will be able to do will be able to push this technique really down to things like Earth mass things and look for potential um, Earth-like planets. And then finally, because of this sensitivity, we'll actually be able to measure their atmospheres. So look at the gas in the atmospheres of these extrasolar planets and look for traces like in our own um, atmosphere, like carbon, and carbon monoxide and oxygen, and also look potentially for signs of photosynthesis. So um, I won't go through this in too much detail, but basically um, there are techniques to do with spectroscopy. Um, and here you see basically an exoplanet orbiting um, its, its star. And you can actually see variations because of the planet orbiting the star in the actual light that you receive. So when the star is, um, the planet is illuminated, you get an increase in the total um, emission from the system. And that's how you can infer that they're there. And there's also different spectral signatures that we can see in the spectra. And that's how we can identify what exoplanets are. Um, 
and then I'll just start this movie again. And down here, there's been a really recent result on basically mapping the surface of stars and very faint stars called brown dwarfs. And basically, it's using a similar technique that you're able to basically identify things like oxygen and carbon monoxide and water um, in um, stellar atmospheres here. But we'll be able to do exactly the same thing um, with extrasolar planets with the ELT. So what this movie is showing is a rotation of um, this very low mass star. And you can basically the, the light and the dark components are picking out these different molecules. And you can basically start to see that there are clouds of different material probing different um, depths into the atmosphere. And so we can start to do things like space weather and look at seasons of exoplanets. And that's the kind of stuff that you know, is really beyond our capabilities now, but will be routine for the ELT. So moving on to black holes. So we know that there are black holes across the universe. We know they have a great deal of impact in the way that galaxies form. And they basically come in three sizes, a lot like T-shirts. <laughs> uh, stellar size, um, uh, medium, which are basically like star clusters, and really, really huge um, ones, what we call supermassive black holes, that lie in the centers of galaxies. Um, but we really don't know how to measure their masses very well, and we've only done it up to a certain point. So the ELT will be able to really push this into a more systematic search and increase the number of galaxies that we can measure black hole masses in. And this is just a movie of our own um, galactic center. So this is work done with the ELT by Reinhard Genzel's group. And you can actually, with today's technology, and after you know, long baselines of observations, track the motion of stars <coughs> in the galactic center. So here you can see um, basically all these stars. We've now got their orbits, and they're orbiting this central body here that's basically invisible in the optical light, so you don't see it in this. But we know, or we think that's where the Milky Way's black hole is, is centered. And these orbits basically let us constrain the mass of the galactic center black hole. And this is just a movie from the TMT of what you can expect with an ELT. So this is basically the equivalent of the movie you just saw on the last slide. But here this shows what you can do with current adaptive optics, um, next generation adaptive optics, and what you'll be able to do with the 30 meter telescope. So you see you can really see a lot more of the individual stars all moving around this central black hole that you see there marked with, with the cross. Um, and then galaxies themselves, like there's a huge array of different types of galaxies. Some of them are, are really um, spherical looking and quite dull looking, kind of like this. Some have hugely complicated disks and arms. There's dust, there's um, compact objects, but there's also lots of mergers and, and very irregular galaxies. And we, you know, while we have a lot of information on, on how galaxies were formed, there's still a lot more that we don't know. So we want to know how do galaxies form how do they build up their stars? And why are there such a different array of types of galaxies? So we can do this thing called stellar archaeology, which is basically looking into nearby galaxies, and looking at individual stars in nearby galaxies. Up to now, we can do this in our own Milky Way and look at the different populations making up the Milky Way. But with the ELT, we'll be able to do this um, for stars in our, uh, for galaxies in our nearby universe, and really understand about how galaxies built up, um, how the material and the stars first started to form, and that tells us a lot about um, the history of um, star formation and galaxy formation. Then we can really look at the very first stars that formed soon after the Big Bang. So this is the Big Bang. There was a period. Um, where there was no light in the universe, and then basically the universe switched on. And it's that epoch that we want to capture with the ELT. So currently we can, we can find very high redshift galaxies, and you can see here they look fairly dull. They're all very small, but that's because they're all limited by the quality of the images that we can get. With the ELT, we'll be able to really resolve these and, and understand the structures of them 
and look for the kind of objects that formed that are basically the seed galaxies for things like the Milky Way. And then the final thing I'll just mention is we can also do a cosmological test. So we can actually measure the universe expanding in real time. So some of you may recall that there was a, a Nobel Prize in physics um, that was related to the expansion of the universe. So um, in these guys mentioned here, Thor Permeter, Brian Schmidt, and Adam Rees, basically discovered that not only is the universe expanding, it's accelerating. And if it's accelerating, we need to understand why it's accelerating. Basically, there's something, some matter or energy in the universe that's causing this expansion. And because we don't know what it is, it's called dark energy. Um, but in the hunt and the dark energy and trying to understand what it is, is one of the forefront astronomical questions um, of, of this time. So the way that the ELT will be able to contribute to this is because um, they'll be able to make a measurement of the universe directly expanding through light. And what you see here is a spectrum that's been blown up. And what this is, is if you look towards bright objects like quasars, which are very bright black holes, basically the light that you see from the quasar, um, some of it gets absorbed by all this structure that you see between us and the quasar. And this structure is actually the structure or the fabric of the universe. These are filaments and structures of gas clouds that basically uh, cause absorption in the light. So each of these dips here corresponds to some matter along the line of sight that's absorbing the light. And basically, as the universe expands, these absorption features slightly shift. So I'm just going to flash through these two slides. Can you see that shift there? So it's that shift that we're trying to measure. But the scale of that shift is actually what we would see if we were observing for a million years. So obviously we're not planning to base our science on that kind of time scale. But effectively by measuring lots of quasars um, and monitoring them over 20 years, you can basically get, um, we have enough precision in the spectrographs to make a direct constraint on the expansion of the universe and dark energy. So yeah, in 15 years, we can, we can measure a noticeable shift. So I'm just going to wrap up now. So um, some of you may have heard last week, um, we finally got approval for the project to start in earnest. That means the phase one funds are all in hand, and we can let the main contracts for the dome and main structure and the primary mirror. Um, as I mentioned, Chile's donated the land, and the works on the site and the infrastructure are underway. Um, and this is just the anticipated schedule. It actually started earlier this year, um, and we can expect operations in about 10 years. So I'm just going to end with a non-professionally done slide, um, which basically has a couple of local references. If you next pass by them, I believe this is Sussex Heights, which has a height of 102 metres. Um, and I, this is um, the Brighton Dome, I think it's called, which is about 20 metres high. So if you see either of these, um, just think of, of the ELT in comparison, and it's really a mammoth project. Um, and I'll just put you to these web pages where you can find out more information, as well as download some of these really nice pictures, not mine, <laughs> understandably. Um, and we also have the UK project pages available where you can learn more about what the UK is doing in this project. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much indeed. I've used some big telescopes in my time. I've used two and a half metre telescopes, four metre telescopes, eight metre telescopes. These are enormous. This will be five times bigger. I just can't get my head around it. <laughs> but we do have some time for questions. Is there any questions from the audience? How large is the world's largest telescope? Um, currently, the largest one is, um, I think it's. 10, no, it's 12 metres, I think. It's the Gran Tacan in the Canary Islands, so that's run by the Spanish on, in La Palma. Um, the, um, with the direct method for observing planets, what, I'm just sort of trying to 
explain that again in terms of how does it um, does it allow you to sort of understand, learn more about the planet to observe its atmosphere, or do you have to rely on sort of more traditional methods, kind of like observing the spectrum of the planet's atmosphere? So. Um, Basically, you know, I was showing that movie, which I didn't explain very well, but basically, when you directly detect the planet itself, what you're actually picking up is usually the reflected light of the um, parent star. But because you know the kind of spectral emission of that parent star, you also know any of the spectral features in our own atmosphere that come into your spectrum. If you remove both of those, you basically are left with the spectrum of the atmosphere of the planet itself, which is something you can't do currently. Um, well, you can do it with kind of with more separated systems or, or things where the contrast ratio between the star and the planet is less. So currently, um, this contrast ratio is about a million in difference. What the ELT will be able to do is do that to a billion difference in contrast ratio, and that lets you basically reach planets that are more like Earth, so things that are, you know, not supermassive Jupiters, but um, things like rocky planets or things like Jupiter. So that reflected light, and if you directly detect it, means that you're really observing the planet's um, atmosphere directly itself, or you're <coughs> directly just imaging them. It doesn't have to be spectroscopy. You can actually see the planet. I haven't got a picture in here, but there has been um, direct imaging of some extra pla extrasolar planetary systems that we know now, but these are typically um, much larger than our current solar system. They're, you know, four to five times larger, and these planets are very far out. They're not like kind of the Earth-like planets. So the goal really is to reduce um, the, the dimensions of, of where you can do this kind of science to things that are more like and as compact as the solar system. Yeah. Does this mean that you have to keep observing the type of hit on the next player will be better and better image? Um can you use similar techniques to remove diffraction from the beam to open the core of the image? So I didn't hit the end of it. And also can you use similar techniques to remove the diffraction that would cause how to use beams on the end? Um you can't you can't reduce the diffraction pattern. That's just determined by the optics itself. So you'll always have kind of the central core and the rings. But going back to the adaptive optics, this is done on a very fast time scale. So there is a delay, like you said. Um, but the faster that you can measure and correct that delay is basically limited by your computational algorithms. <coughs> so it's constantly monitored while you're observing. And these things are done on you know, femtoseconds, I'm not quite sure, but, you know, very, very fast timescales. And there's a lot of real-time computing development that goes in to make kind of um, adaptive optics work. And to get to extrasolar planets, there's actually what they call extreme AO, which is doing this at an even higher level and faster level so that you can <coughs> really beat down all the atmospheric aberrations as much as you can and get back to the effective um, diffraction pattern of the telescope, which is, you know, that ring-like structure that I showed, but you can't eliminate the diffraction pattern. That's really a, as best you're going to get. Well, it's all going to go out to tender, um, but because this is a European um, project, typically it's European companies that respond. So for the dome and main structure, um, there's actually a Dutch company who are managing the tender and that's basically distributed to all the member state countries and industry are encouraged within each country to respond to those calls. Um, for the mirrors, there's actually several optics companies across Europe um, and actually the main one is, is in France and they've already, you know, they have mirror processing, uh, well, mirror manufacturing um, post, um, plants in place um, and there's also a Welsh company again this has been in the news um, on and off who have been developing a way of making these hexagons and polishing them to the required accuracy and they basically these two companies have different methodologies the French um, company make 
basically a circular mirror and then um, make the hexagon after they've polished it to the required accuracy. The Welsh company are investigating, it's actually not just Welsh, it's a, a national consortium, but it's primarily in Wales, where they polish, they cut out the hexagon and then polish that really precisely and right out to the edges and they've been able to do this but it's a very um, it's a very difficult thing to do um, and basically the companies will have to respond to the calls that ESO puts out and these two companies will have to put forward a, a viable um, plan and cost for how these mirrors will be produced so the, they're kind of like the two big ticket items the dome and main structure and the primary mirror manufacture um, and that will be decided based on on how what the response to the call for tenders are two more questions so you can't currently we can't because you know I, I mentioned you need the surface to be very accurate um, so you can only polish um, mirrors to that accuracy out to eight meters. It's just a, a constraint on, on maintaining the quality of the surface over a large area. So the reason to use hexagons is because you can make them smaller and they're going to use these 1.4 meters. But also, you know, like I was mentioning, this polishing technology, either if you chop it out from the circular mirror or you do it right as a hexagon and polish it, you can achieve that. And also, you use hexagons rather than circles because you can fill your aperture. And I think the interesting thing with GMT is that they're really the pioneers in doing this kind of polishing and of large telescope mirrors. And they're basically utilizing that to be faster. So they'll have these eight mirrors, oh, sorry, seven mirrors of eight meters across. And they, they won't necessarily fill, or they won't fill their, their aperture diameter with mirrored surface, which means they just lose light, but they still get the advantage in spatial resolution because their overall size is still 24 meters, even though they're not collecting as much light. <coughs> um, with the adaptive optics and, and any advancements of it in the future, is there still any point in putting telescopes in space? Um, well, there's there's different advantages of putting things into space um, and there's clear advantages to having things on the ground. So the reason why this is being on the ground and not in space is that basically you can't launch a 40 metre mirror. So the James Webb is a 6.5 metre mirror and the way they do that, it's also got a hexagonal structure of mirrors and they basically fold it up, um, put it in the top of the launch rocket and then it opens out once it's in space. So they say it works. I'm not that convinced, but I'm sure it works. Um, so there's basically a fundamental limitation in terms of mirror size. And because mirror size is um, proportional to the resolution, um, you really need to do this from the ground to get that kind of resolution. So in the longer wavelengths, you might have heard of radio interferometers like ALMA, where you basically have lots of unit telescopes and using interferometry, you can combine the light to basically mimic a very large collecting area. So then the, the separation between these unit telescopes defines what your resolution will be. Um, and you can do that. Oh, they are doing that with, with ALMA, and there'll be a forthcoming radio telescope called the Square Kilometre Array, where basically, again, the name tells you <laughs> what's in it. It's going to be unit telescopes spread over a square kilometre. And that will give you, again, unprecedented resolution. But it's very challenging to do this in the optical. So it's much easier in the radio and the longer wavelengths. So really the only way to do this in the optical is by building big mirrors. So the other advantage of going into space is there are clear bits of the atmosphere. Let's go back to the beginning of the talk, um, where basically the atmospheric... Sorry, this might take a while. Um, the atmospheric absorption basically blocks out all of the light. So as you go to the mid-infrared, for example, you can only observe from the ground up to about 20 microns. After that, all the light, sorry, I should have gone back the other way, um, is absorbed. So I should have explained this one. <laughs> so there are, 
uh, regions of the wavelength space where you need to go into space and you always will have some advantage of not being bothered by the atmosphere. And obviously there are also times where the atmosphere is so turbulent that adaptive optics can't work as well. So there are, you know, there are still advantages. And the biggest advantage of being on the ground is the cost. So if you imagine Hubble, you know, that's in a low <coughs> Earth orbit, so it's been possible to go back and service Hubble. Um, James Webb, you won't be able to do that. And the cost of Hubble is far exceeds what the ELT will do. And if you think about satellite telescopes, they actually get launched with technology that's about 10 years old because they want it to work and they want reliable, safe things. Um, whereas with the ELT, because it's on the ground, we can update it, we can take advantage of new technology. So there's you know, different advantages to both. So what I was mentioning here, this, this curve that you see here is basically the absorption by the atmosphere. And you can see in the visible band, there's basically no absorption. And this is exactly why our eyes are sensitive to visible light. But as soon as you get into the UV or into the infrared and microwave background, you see, sorry, the microwave, you start to see quite a lot of absorption by the atmosphere. So there's definitely regions where it's advantageous to go into space. No, because you'll never get over this absorption. So the adaptive optics just gets rid of turbulence, but if the light isn't getting through the atmosphere, we can't do this from the ground. Well, thank you very much. We'll have to end it there. Um, you can ask questions um, afterwards if you, if you wish. Um, just a few notes to make um, that um, it's a wonderful project. What really excites me about this is not what we think we will find out but there will be things that the ELT will discover that we've not even dreamt about. And that's what excites me the most. So it's a wonderful time for uh, British and, and European astronomy. And uh, for the younger members of the audience, um, you'll be, when, when this is completed in 10 years time, um, you'll be doing your, beginning your research careers in astronomy, I'm sure some of you will be. And you'll be the perfect ages <coughs> to um, get the first data of the ELT and make some wonderful discoveries. So it's uh, a very exciting time. So final things for me to say are um, thank you very much for coming. Merry Christmas, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year and hope to see you all again in 2015. And just to end, thank you very much for that wonderful talk and we really do appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.